All right. Welcome to another conversation between women. And it is spring, totally spring here where I'm at. And I'm so excited. Are you, is it spring where you're at yet? Yes. Yeah. It, uh, well, I, it sort of has the feeling like we jump straight into summer, but that might just be because as soon as the sun is shining, I'm out in a tube top and a skirt. So, um, it's been really nice. Yeah. yeah. The last few days. Yeah. I got, I actually have my first little sunburn on my neck back here. I was mowing the lawn yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so excited about it. I've been planting all kinds of flower seeds and starting all my herb seeds. I usually don't get my herb seeds started until like late April. I'm just so behind on it. And I, we, I get like crop seeds started before that, but I was really determined last week. I was like, I'm starting all my herb seeds. I'm going to get these out of here before we're in like the big rush of summer plants in the greenhouse. And um, yeah, so I'm super, super happy. I just feel so much joy with life right now. I'm like, this is what it's like to have sunshine. <laughs> I've been going yeah. out to the, before, it, before it had gotten warm, I'd been going out a couple times a week to the greenhouse because it's always like 70 or 80 degrees in there even in the winter time so i've been going out there like a cat and just like sunbathing in the greenhouse <laughs> for the last couple of weeks so yeah now i don't have to do that <laughs> that was a thing i isn't it like a airbnb or something that people are creating whole patio setups like in greenhouses so that you can rent it out and like go have these nice warm Maybe it's, I think it's for renting or maybe it was just something on Pinterest where people were doing That's that. Awesome. Like if you have a greenhouse, like put a little patio table in there and take your morning coffee and. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. That's a great idea. Maybe Next I winter. should do that. <laughs> Invite people over to my greenhouse. Yeah. The middle of winter. Greenhouse parties. <laughs> yeah. Well, be nice. what's been, what's been happening with you spiritually or. Mm. <laughs> Life-wise. So much. Uh, I feel like. March has been um, a really, gosh, really like almost at the end of March too. I feel like March has, has just been really, uh, I get intense. I don't know. Intense, I guess, has not negative connotations, but kind of like, it's just, it's felt very energetic, I guess, in a, in variable ways. Um, and I listened to on March 10th, I think it was, I listened to an energy forecast update kind of thing um, by this woman, I think her name's Lori Ladd. And she was just, I guess she, she has her guides and she was connecting to them about March. And she was just saying that March, every single day in March was going to offer an opportunity for like massive transformation pretty much. <laughs> um, and and I kind of sat with that and thought, okay, so I just have to get through March. And if I look at March as this, you know, I have like 20 something more days, 21 more days. And if I look at March as an opportunity to burn, because she was talking about, um, it's about learning how to stand in the fire and not get burned. Like to let, my, and I took that as, or at least from my personal experience, how it feels is like, you know, letting things burn up, burn away and, you know, burn everything that's not me, right? Or burn everything that isn't in alignment or doesn't work or all that. Um, and so I was like, okay, if I can, if I can handle, I can, I can handle 20 days of this, you know, I can, if I can commit myself to just say, okay, I'm going to let it all burn. And I'm just going to do the best that I can to open to this whole process. Cause it's only 20 days, you know, and it was, it was just nice to have that sort of, um, short-term goal that seemed manageable versus like, I have all this stuff that I have to heal and all this stuff that I have to burn up and all this, you know, there's all this energy and when's it going to end? Cause I feel like for the last year, um, you know, it, it's always like, and this week is going to be super intense and this week and this week and when's it going to end? Oh, well, it's not going to end because Pluto doesn't end the transit for two more years. But, you know, it's like this, like, ah, and so it was nice to just encapsulate it in 20 days and say, okay, if this, if March is about massive transformation, if I can transmute anything and have massive transformation every single day, then how much of that can I actually do? And if I just do that, for, for March, for these 20 days, then by the end of it, I will actually have 
arrived at a new place where I could probably handle a lot more. And so it won't seem like such a, um, overload to go forward and, and deal with, you know, whatever comes. Um, and so that's, I guess that's kind of the approach that I've been taking and it's been really awesome, uh, because I have found it to be true. And so, you know, I don't know if it's, <laughs> if I hadn't known about that and if I hadn't made the commitment, what I actually have felt that that amount of transformation was possible. I don't know, but, um, which is funny cause I'm reading Joe Dispenza's you are the placebo. So maybe it's <laughs> the placebo effect going on there, but it's, which I'm sure we'll get into at some point. Um, but yeah, it's just been really, um, that's, that was a really supportive thing to hear and to approach this month with because it has been uh, a lot of energy and it's felt like, um, like my friend and I were trying to plan a trip and it's like, it felt like every day we were like, well, what about this? But maybe this, and you know, like everything was just continuously shifting and everything continues to feel like it's shifting moment by moment. Um, so yeah, that's where I am at this moment. I love that. And I, I really wish that I would have listened to that, that, you, that, that woman talking before this month, because it makes so much more sense for my month, you know, how my month has gone. Um, because so, you know, we, last time we talked, I, we were talking a lot about meditation and how it was a really good time to start meditating because there seemed to be a lot of like energy for that, like for transformation and for like doing the work. And um, I went right, like sh right after that conversation, I went and traveled back home to visit my family. And there was just this, it, even before I left to go see my family, there was this shift in my brain. I had been in a space of such, um, I guess I'll call it positivity or like joy and just good feeling, you know, there wasn't a lot of these negative thoughts that I frequently have that's kind of normal for me to have um you know like i'm driving down the highway and i see in my mind's eye like a car crash and like all the things that could go wrong you know like that's kind of how my brain always works and so there wasn't that going on and then i went home and literally i was driving back to see my family and there was a semi flipped over on the side of the road and i had that vision of like oh my gosh like what happens if i get into a car wreck and i have my child and da -da -da, you know this whole thing right and so i start going and so i just kept having these kind of negative thoughts and um i kind of was just looking at them but not really doing anything about them just not really understanding what was going on like why is this why is this all coming back things were going so good and then I got back home and that situation, like staying with my family, you know, it's like never the most, for me, it's not ever the most uplifting situation. It was really hard for me to stay on track meditating and I wasn't able to focus while meditating and just all of the work that I'd been doing, it was really difficult. And um, so then I, you know, came back, went through all that, came back and I still, it's eased up a little bit, but I've still been having that. But I just kept telling myself while I was away, like something's going to happen that's going to snap me back into like connection with God or like that's going to snap me back into this ability to meditate. Like I just have to wait for that and like ask for that help. And so that was all of my prayer was like, I cannot get rid of these thoughts on my own. Like I really need help. Like I need you, God or guru, somebody to come and just like take them from me. And I did have an experience of like feeling, you know, this like, energetic lifting off of some of this stuff. But then as soon as I got home, I get my mail the first night that I'm home. And of course it's the next lesson in the self-realization fellowship lessons, which I get every two weeks. It's the next lesson. And I open it up and there is this kind of, um, a little a letter letter from them what they call the mother center. It's the, the monks and the nuns send you a letter. There's a letter in there from them of like, you're probably getting off track right now and that's okay. And here are some things to help you to remember to stay on track. And it was exactly huh. what I needed. It was just like divine, you know, and I love that. And it's happened. They've done this a couple times with me and I, I just love that they do that. They just know that like, okay, at about this week, people are going to start like falling off the horse, you know, so let's line it back out. And so it was really helpful and um, it really energized me to, get back to doing the work because I was really losing focus and um, which led me to my whole looking at my will in general in life and how my will works and this ability to lose, to lose focus and to lose 
my will. And um, so it was really great. And now I feel back on track. And so hearing you say all that stuff about March, maybe it was just all, maybe it was that. <laughs> maybe yeah. it was just all that stuff. It was just happening for all of us. So. Yeah, I feel like that, you know, the earlier in March, because you were gone the first couple of weeks, mm -hmm. right? So earlier in March, that was March 10th. And I, I felt like the day that I heard that and maybe the day before and the day after were very um, fiery. <laughs> so there was definitely a lot of that, um, I guess maybe more of a struggle at the beginning of the month and a lot more flow towards this half of the month. Um, yeah. I definitely felt more combative at the beginning of the month, like just ready yes. to fight anybody, like say something. I dare you to <laughs> say something to me. I'll rip your face off. <laughs> uh, uh, well, that kind of, you know, just thinking about that, it brings me actually to the one thing that I'd been circling around with this morning. Um, <laughs> I, I feel, <laughs> I also, I ate a few things recently that maybe weren't, well, I don't know. I, you know, I, I used to be obsessed about what I ate food and, and if they were having some like, <laughs> um, neurotoxic effect or whatever. And I sort of started thinking about that today. I was like, well, I don't know if I'm clear. Do I have brain fog? Is this what brain fog feels like? And was it because I had yogurt last week? You know, and I was like, I'm not going to do that. I don't even care. I ate too many different things and I'm just not going to go down that again it's entirely possible that I ate something that's sort of like tweaking my brain a little bit right now. Um, but I'm having this, like the things I've been thinking about our time. Well, the thing that the, I don't know, it doesn't even exist. So I don't know how to talk about it, but the thing that I've been thinking about is time. Um, and, and just sort of reflecting on the month. It's like, I don't even know. I, where are we? What day is it? I, I sort of, I feel like I keep having that experience, like a, a coming to, you know, like, like I got knocked on the head and then I'm like waking up and like, okay, I kind of know where I am and know what's going on. And did anything happen before this? You know, I guess it's like, a, <laughs> it's what happened. It's what happens when you arrive in the present moment, I think. And I think what's happening, like if you're always in time, you're either looking back at the past or, or projecting into the future and you're never here in this moment. And so you can sort of, you're constantly gauging where you are in reality, which it's like, um, I remember in Eat, Pray, Love, Elizabeth Gilbert talked about how the Balinese people would always ask her where she was going and where she came from because they wanted to, they, their way of interacting was to understand like where you were in space to be able to, to place you in a context. Mm -hmm. um, and it's sort of like that, like you're constantly trying to, or I am, I assume lots of people are trying to do this, like trying to just know where you are. And so you do that by saying, where have I been and where am I going? And I'm right here in between those, but actually that's not where you are. Where you are is right here in this moment, which has nothing to do with any of that. Um, so I don't know, I was thinking about that and then, and about how uh, this morning, you know, trying to get my daughter out the door to go take her to the babysitters was like yesterday we had to get out the door cause I had to go get my car fixed and like right at the end, I was like, God, oh, we're going to be so late and I'm so stressed. And, you know, we had an hour drive and it was, um, I kind of went into that stressed, we're going to be late thing. And I was like, I don't want to do that again. And so I primed, attempted to prime myself for this morning and thought, okay, I'm not going to do that again. I'm just going to be easy and flow. We've got plenty of time. We'll, we'll make it all work. And then I got sort of sucked into like folding all the clothes in her closet because I was trying to pick out clothes and it was such a mess. And I was just, I don't know. I thought I had time or something, but um, that's why I was wondering if I had brain fog. I was like, why did I do that? But I ended up, we came out of the bedroom and it was like that moment, that minute it was time to leave <laughs> and we were not ready. Um, and so I ended up getting so angry, but I was just like, okay, just don't react. Just don't react. Just don't react. You know, just trying to control it and just stay very calm and controlled, but <laughs> like fuming on the inside. And we got out the door and it was all fine. But then when we came home, when I came home, I realized that I had this whole, what I had sort of done before leaving the house was created 
like created stress and problems for myself by like going into the circle of like all the things that I had to do before sitting down to, to do this podcast, you know, cause there's all these like little things, right. Set the scene, blah, 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 whatever. And, and I also had done laundry this morning and I was going to make my lunch. And it's like, I don't need to hang the laundry. I don't need to like, why am I adding things in as if to like create more stuff, cramming more stuff into time that feels like I don't have. And so there was that piece of it. And so then the other piece was, okay, well, if I'm, if I'm doing that, then I'm obsessed with time and then I'm stressing out. So what if I just say like, I have enough time for everything and slow way down and come down to the present moment. Cause Joe Dispenza, I haven't read this chapter in becoming supernatural yet. I'm really looking forward to it, but it's about going from, okay. I think it's from going from space time to time space. I don't remember which one it is, but it's basically going from where you're operating in space where you have, you have infinite space, but limited time to going where you have unlimited time and, and space, there is no space. Like you're just, you're just in space, but like you have an unlimited amount of time because you're always in the present moment. And so everything collapses into the now. I'm which sorry. Is totally, which that, is totally cosmic, you know, like that's like being yes. in the cosmic. It, yeah. In the quantum in the field. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I apologize, Joe Dispenza, if I totally butchered that. I haven't read it yet. But <laughs> from what I listened to, that's like my sense about it. And so I was playing around with that right before we got on the podcast because I was like, okay, here are the things that I do need to do and want to do before we sit down. And, and then I just intentionally moved really slowly, but just like paid attention to what I was doing and realized that it was like just a completely different energy than the way that I had been operating earlier and that the a completely different energy than the way that I often operate where I'm sort of a like go 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 I guess um and it was really cool and then it was like totally peaceful and I had enough time and I just kept slowing myself down and saying I've got enough time I'm fine and I had enough time and I was fine um but you know even things like moving the ethernet cable and then moving the the um what are these things called i think i do have brain fog a microphone <laughs> or a computer yeah, the microphone the, no the the power jack the, the cord <laughs> for Whatever. plugging it in. Oh, okay yeah the, the power cord that's what power we'll call cord it. and like plugging them into my computer and plugging them into the wall there's like you know lots of cords everywhere and and i was like i i typically probably would be like, okay, I got to plug this in. Then I got to plug that in. And I was like, I'm just going to take my time and plug it in and plug it in. And I was envisioning like guys I've seen like at music shows, you know, who are like the sound guys or even just like the, I guess the musicians too, who are like dealing with all their stuff and they like take the time and like wrap up the cables, you know, and it's not a million it's cords. Like, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And you're like, I'm just going to do it. And it's like no big deal. So anyway, that's, another thing that's on my brain. <laughs> well, I just, I love how, I love that we're doing this podcast mostly because I get to see, it, like I get to, we get to video how we're pro progressing because the last time we talked, remember we talked kind of, well, we've talked about mitten life, which you kind of mentioned, mm. like shoving everything in. But then last time we kind of talked about this, about um, the, that Taoist saying that um, the sage does nothing and leaves nothing undone. Yeah. It's yeah. like along that same, along, it's just further along that same thing of like, now you're actually in real time, like getting, get like practicing yeah. that, like doing that. And it is really cool. And yeah, I've been kind of experiencing that. Um, I think mostly for me, it's because it's like hormonal, like progesterone or something, but I'm experiencing that getting back into that you know, like, I don't know if you experienced this after you had a baby, but the, the feeling of timelessness, like right after you mm -hmm. have a baby where you have, I mean, I mean, I never experienced this until I had a child because I'm so in the time, like in the flow, like I'm on time with everything, you know, I'm very aware of, um, even when there's not a clock around, like I'm aware of timeliness. And so I've never really been in this like natural flow and been like a person who just showed up three hours late or something, you know, that would, that would never be me. And, um, although I do strive to be that person sometimes, <laughs> but, um, after I had my daughter, 
I remember my friend saying, just stay in the timelessness as long as you can. And I thought, well, I don't know what that means. But after I had her, I experienced that where I would just be staring at her, like sitting on the couch, staring at her. And the next thing I know, the sun's gone down. And I'm like, wow, how long have I, I mean, probably six hours. I would just be sitting there staring at her and have no idea. And it seemed like a minute. And it, and it, was, the, it was the weirdest weirdest experience of my life, but also I loved it because it really helped me to understand what people are talking about when they talk about like timelessness or like to understand other people who are late all the time because they're just, they're, they're just in that flow all the time, you know, and what a great place to be. And if we could all be in there in that, in that flow, it would be awesome because, you know, when we would just <laughs> yeah. all perfectly come together at the right time, you know, like as you're rushing around doing all your stuff before this, I was like, how am I going to get my child to like, not want to be on this podcast the whole time? Because I had her for the first few minutes. And so, you know, if we would have both known that we were both dealing with that, maybe we would have taken our time a little bit more and just, you know, you would have known that I was going to be having this kid at the beginning. And so you didn't need to rush around and then I would have known you were rushing around so I could have taken more you know like been a little bit more laid back yeah, yeah so the time thing is it is interesting and it is it's I would like to experience timelessness more often <laughs> that mm -hmm. is that is a goal for me if it well, can be also a goal. <laughs> I don't know if that can be a goal or not because <laughs> it's not somewhere that you're going yeah it's like not a destination right here in this moment yeah <laughs> um well, you know, it's funny because I, I was thinking about it in terms of, you know, getting, getting my daughter in the car. It's, I remember reading once that the more that you rush your child, the slower they move. And so I'm always aware of that. And I've tried, I try to just like, okay, let's go. Okay, let's go. You know, instead of like, get on, come out, uh, you know, I try and I've, I've become much more aware of like projecting this like rushed energy we got to go we got to go thing onto her because i don't like it on myself and you know it totally came from my upbringing because i was always late and i know we've talked about this on the podcast before actually um and so i'm you know doing my best to just be like we okay we just let's get going you know it's time to go and, and move us along but i was a little bit hyper stressed this morning and <laughs> just a just very aware of like we're almost at the car she knows that we're already late and <laughs> and she's just talking she's just chatting and she's you know telling me about something and she's like standing at the car door and she's just not opening the car door and not getting in and I'm like get in the car please get in the car please <laughs> you know and she's just like do to do you know it's like we're so close and she's still just in her own world enjoying, of time yeah. yes. like enjoying like, herself <laughs> yes and i and i was so aware of that i was like okay i don't i don't want to take that away from her and i want her in the car <laughs> but i just i i'm you know i'm i'm like grateful that still in spite of my insanity sometimes around time and getting out the door which i mean i've way cut down and i've <clears throat> i've made lots of strides in that department it obviously still happens but um, but it, it used to be a lot worse. And in spite of that, she still maintains this ability to be in her childhood realm of time, timelessness, whatever it is. And, you know, yesterday we went to, um, we went to the car dealer to, I had a safety recall and had to get it fixed. And, um, and we ended up, we had, it was like three hours and we ended up just, basically hanging out like in the parking lot drive area. There was this little bus stop in the sun and there was little trees. And so we just like putzed around for I mean, maybe about two hours and 45 minutes. I don't know. It was like, you know, for a good while. Um, and I realized that if I, by not creating any problems out, cause there were some there was a reason that that happened the way it did, but by not like creating problems out of the situation and not projecting like, Oh, I wish we could be doing something else. So we should be doing something else. We're just kind of stuck here or whatever. I just allowed it to just be easeful and flowy and joyful, like just not exuberant, but just peacefully joyful, you know, and it was such a sunny, beautiful, warm day. And so we just kind of, floated along and and I stayed in the moment with her 
way, like, I mean, I sustained that for way longer than I ever have. And it was just like lovely. It was just the nicest day. And then we realized we're like, oh, the car's probably going to be ready in like 20 minutes. And, you know, and I realized that the, the more that I stayed at that pace, the calmer and quieter she was and more relaxed she was. And she was just happy. She was just happy to like sit there. You know, we, we walked from the car place over to this bus stop and the bus stop was just facing the sun. And so we just sat down and was like, well, are you hungry? We could eat our lunch here. And she said, yeah. And so we just sat and we just ate and we hung out and then we walked, you know, she said, oh, I'm ready to go walk a little bit. And so we walked a little bit and it was just so like, there were no problems. You know, Eckhart Tolle talks about that, like create no more problems, come into this present moment because in the present moment, there are no problems. There's just what is right. And there were just no problems. And we just, one thing to the next. And it was just, I don't know, I guess I, <laughs> this may sound ridiculous. She's five years old, but it feels like maybe in the first time, for the first time in five years that I really was where she was and was just there with mm -hmm. her and it, like got a glimpse, a, whatever that, you know, a glimpse of whatever that is that kids live in and experience and I was like, this is really nice. We don't have to do anything and we don't have to feel anything about not doing anything. We're just here and it's sunny and we're eating and now we're walking and now we have to go to the bathroom. You're just living your life walking. and it's beautiful. Yeah. That you just can live. I love that. I love that so much. I can feel like I could, I was there with you. I feel it. I love that so much. That's yeah. I, I love those moments. That's what I love about going out in the woods. That's how I feel every time I'm in the woods. It's like, oh, look, there's a caterpillar. Let's follow that caterpillar and see where it goes. And it's like this whole, you know, never ending thing. And yeah, if only we could do that more often. There's this new book that I'm reading. Um, it's one of the required readings for this um, innate postpartum certification that I'm doing with um, Rochelle Garcia Saliga and the book, I really want to recommend it to so many people, so many women, but it is like a fierce read. Like even I agreeing with it and like aligning with it and feeling so represented in it, I feel like it's just, it's so challenging because she doesn't pussyfoot around. She just like says it like, this is how it's supposed to be. And you know, you really can't be in victim consciousness at all to read it. Or you'll think that you're like a piece of shit, but, um, uh, but it's been a really good read and the book is called, it's really hard to find. And I could only find it on that website that's named after giant goddess women, um, which I don't like to buy books from, but, uh, she's from Argentina. Her name is Laura Gutman and the book is called maternity coming face to face with our shadow right there. Mm -hmm. The title is just like, tells you yeah. everything you know and it really is she just dives into all of that like coming face to face with your shadow as a mother and in it she talks about that like that's what I just got finished reading the chapter I just got finished reading she talks about this like we're always asking our children to wait or forcing our children to move faster like we're always putting them in this imaginary like time struggle <laughs> of like no hurry 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 no wait 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 and I do it um, well Layla and I don't have like rushy times time struggles because she's timely like I am so I just tell her to do something and she like she gets ready and it happens so I'm really lucky in that way because I don't know how I would handle a child who is like slower than me but um but she but we do get in this wait, wait, wait thing. Like I, I mean, I tell her to wait so much and part of it I do intentionally because I was not a patient child. I'm patience is something I still struggle with. So I always want to instill in her like patience, like, you know, but then what Laura talks about in this book is, you know, like we ask our children to wait for food, you know, and she's specifically talking about infants more than mm -hmm. older children mm -hmm. and how like parents, mothers will be like, well, I just breastfed or I just fed the baby. And I, it hasn't been three hours. Cause there's this like arbitrary number of three hours right. or he's, he's just trying to get attention or, you know, whatever. And so we make our yeah. children wait to be nursed or something, but it also happens. Like I do it with my daughter, like waiting for food and 
you know, in my mind, it's like, I remember when I first had her, the biggest struggle I had was that I couldn't finish anything like, cause the child needs something and you have to stop so many projects. So you have 8,000 projects that you can't finish. And that was the hardest thing for me because I worked really hard in my life to be someone who finishes things. Like I was always a quitter and it took me a lot of work to be someone who finishes things. So I have to finish things when I start them or they just don't get finished. And so she kind of took me back <laughs> to this thing of when I was a kid of like not ever finishing anything. And so one of the things I, the ground rules that I like laid out is like, okay, I will get you what you need, but you have to wait until I get done with this one thing. And now reading this book, uh, Maternity, I am just realizing like, maybe, like, maybe I've been doing wrong this whole time. Like, like, does she, is what I'm doing more important? And like, what's the balance? Like, I, I don't want to be a mother who just stops everything for her kids. Like, I don't want to be that person. I don't think that it makes like healthy children or healthy adults. And, um, and I don't know, like, what's that balance? Like, when do I need to just stop and do what she needs? And like my partner, Sam, he's just come to this thing now where he said, I think he decided this like two years ago. He said, I've just decided that whatever she wants, I'm just going to give it to her. I'm just going to, whatever she wants, I'm just going to give it to her right then. And he went with that. And lately I've noticed he started asking her to wait a little bit, but he's been really good about like, she wants food. He stops what he's doing. He gets her food and then he goes back to what, what he's doing and, you know, I have so much respect for that ability to do that. And I, like, I don't know what the right answer is, you know? Um, but yeah, I, it's the, these imaginary timelines and like figuring out like what is really important, like how, and everything is so subtle and it's all about nuance because there is this thing of like, no, you can't just have what you want when you want it, but yes, you can. Like God gives you right. what you want, you want. I know. but, but at the same time, like. But God also doesn't give you what you want all the time because sometimes like there are or not how you prayers, want it or not how you want it. Yeah. Like yeah. there's unanswered prayers and there's yeah. it's. And so really as parents, I think it's our job to know what your child, like to see what your child needs in that moment. And to know, like when you're like, mm. when I'm just saying no, or to, saying wait, because it's inconvenient for me versus saying wait, because I want her to develop some patience, right? Like that's yeah. a character trait. I'd want her to develop. And so it really does require being in in tune with yourself or at least like having a, a level of self-awareness where you can call bullshit on yourself and be like um I'm really just being lazy right now because I want to finish reading this <laughs> chapter <laughs> but um oh, yeah, yeah and and in that book maternity she talks about this too like this whole thing of how we behave as parents is largely um is largely based on what other people are telling us to do. But I've noticed for myself, it's also, for me, it's largely based on what I personally want to do, like my egoic self, like not mom, but Cameron. And mm -hmm. like, does that fit in with me having to be a mom right now to you? Like, well, it's kind of inconvenient for me right now. <laughs> so yeah. like, we have to be able to, you know, tune out other voices, but also check ourselves and say like, well, you know, yeah, actually I am just being a jerk right now, or yeah, I am just being selfish right now. And yeah, there's just so much, so much subtlety. I remember, I think it was like five or six years ago, I didn't really understand my partner. And I told somebody, I think it's because everything he does is so subtle and I don't understand subtlety. And man, since then, it's all of life has been lessons in subtlety. <laughs> you know, it's the both and universe. There's no, there's no either or there's all this, everything is the gray area. <laughs> yeah. Well, there are so many things that I want to respond to in that. Um, huh, yeah. So the, the thing about that, um, where that line is, I've been, I've been playing with that with my daughter too, about like, am I just, like completely ignoring your needs right now <laughs> because I'm like, I, I, I have a story that like, I did literally everything for you all the time. And I never did anything for myself for so many years. And like, I'm not doing that anymore. You know? So I, there's that piece of it. Um, but I've been realizing lately that I, I, I swung the pendulum to the other extreme, I think. Um, and now I'm, now I'm finding, I'm, I'm approaching a healthier, um, um, 
space with that where recognizing that that there are things that are needed in this moment and like I don't have to resist that I'm not losing really what's made such a big difference is <laughs> of course this work that I'm doing <laughs> with Joe Spencer's uh teachings um and meditations but really it's it's what has been so hard is that I have been operating from the you know survival brain like I've been I've been stuck in this like my needs are not going to get met loop and so it's just been perpetual conflict um, between her needs and my needs and I had this epiphany the other day or I was it was in a meditation and I was what I was telling myself and working with was um, not, you know, my, my needs will get met. I mean, my needs matter, all that stuff that I always thought I needed to work through. But really what it is, is like, I'm okay. Like, I'm going to be okay regardless. Like, I, I am okay. And there is no conflict here. Like, there is, because it's a separation thing, right? And I was like, actually, my daughter and I, we're, we're like, we're not on opposite sides of the fence. We're not fighting across something. We're actually on the same side of the fence. Like, we're all... And, and then it was like about all of humanity, you know, we're, we're actually all on the same side of the fence. And so then there's no fence and it's all just one, right? It's all just this space where I can't lose my power. Like my mentor, a really big thing that's changed for me, that's really been helpful to me is she, she talked about seeing everything as God and doing that really intentionally and saying like, okay, my daughter is God. I am God. The words coming out of my mouth are God. This interaction, this thing, this thing that she needs is God. What I am doing is God. Like I cannot lose my power to anything or anyone because it is all God, which it's all the same energy differentiated in unique manifestations, but I cannot lose my power to anything. And so there is no power struggle between us because there is no separation. So I've been working with that a lot and that's been really helpful. Um, but, and it brings me to this other thing I wanted to respond to what you said that we, you know, there's talk about how we, you know, humans don't know what love is because, and so we have this limited view of what God is because we are projecting our limited understanding of what love is onto God. And like, then that's how God loves us. But actually it's infinite and it's way bigger than we can conceive of. And, and I think we do that with our kids where we have a limited understanding of what a human being needs because we have a limited understanding of love. And so when we look at our children, we say, okay, here are the traits that I see and here's the person that I wanted to, that I want to be. And I think that I am not this person because of who, how I was raised. And so I'm going to raise my child with a different way with these qualities in mind so that I create a person who has these qualities and can avoid suffering, <laughs> doesn't have to work through all the stuff that I've had to work through, whatever. But also as somebody that I like actually want to interact with because I want them to have these qualities. Um, and it's, like we've talked about in the past on this show that it's not like the nothing is a one-to-one, -one, right? Like we're talking about nuances now where it's not like if I tell my child to wait, my child will learn patience and then my child will be a patient person and have no issue with patience, right? It's like, what if it, this, the reality is actually that if for a certain period of time, I acknowledge that everything my child expresses is an actual need and then I meet that need and then my child feels loved and secure and is then able to develop patients naturally as she ages and doesn't feel that her needs are not going to be met and so she has trust in the universe and trust in others and trust in life and trust in herself so that she's then able naturally to be patient because there's no fear there's no conflict there's no separation there's no feeling of lack right but and i think that's that is taught to some extent like even more conventionally where like, you know, up to age one, your baby's wants are also your baby's needs. Mm -hmm. But then it's like after age one, that goes out the window and then you have the terrible two-year-old and it's like, ah, you know, this whole thing. But I know I've, I've read that in some traditional cultures, you know, the child would be indulged up to age four, like anything, even hitting, like they would be indulged with whatever they presented because 
I guess that was understood that there were, those were expressions of needs. And, and I have found with my daughter that, I mean, well, just, you know, for example, yesterday when, when I was in this sort of timeless state with her, that I was in that highly responsive state. And so I, I, <laughs> I'm, I've, I was looking back at this last night and this morning thinking, how did I do that? I want to do that every day. Like what, did, what cosmic grace dropped on my head yesterday that I was able to just hold that space and, and not even not react and to recognize like, oh, here's where I would have reacted like this in the past. I'm not going to do that. And like not have any energy on it, not have any conscious like, oh, you know, like this morning where I was like, okay, I'm really angry, but I'm not going to react. And I'm just going to speak calmly where there was that still that struggle and conflict within mm -hmm. me. Whereas yesterday, you know, I brought a book figuring that maybe we'd find a playground and she'd play and I'd sit and read. But what happened to happening was she was tired and she wanted to lay down in the grass and <laughs> take a nap, which didn't happen, but she did lay down. And I thought, well, I'll just sit here on the bench and I'll read while she naps. And as I'm reading, she starts talking to me and I'm like, had the thought like, well, I thought you were going to be taking a nap. And I thought, well, I don't have to have an issue with this. I can talk to her. Like, cause it, I, my, my, um, you know, when I said I was swinging the pendulum, pendulum to the other side now where it's like about my needs and I need to make sure that I take care of myself. It's like, okay, I'm reading now. So now you need to go play because I'm reading and I would like to be able to read for a few minutes and all the shoulds and all the stories of all the moms who sit and read and their kids are quiet and, you know, all that stuff going on in there. And like, no, I'm going to defend my space. I have boundaries. I'm going to read and you are not going to interrupt me and I'm not going to listen to you, you know, like I need to read for five minutes. Um, and so yesterday it was like, you know, she starts talking and I'm aware that I'm reading and I'm trying to read and she's talking. And so I have to keep stopping. And I thought I had the thought I'm, I'm reading, I'm, I'm going to sit and read and you lay down and you know, then you said you wanted to lay down and be quiet and sleep and I'm going to read. And I was like, well, no, I don't need to do that. It doesn't matter. And so I talked to her and then, you know, we had a few interactions and then I was able even in spite of that, able to finish the chapter. And as soon as I finished the chapter, she said, I'm ready to go walk now. I was like, perfect, <laughs> you know? And so just allowing myself to not be in resistance to it was really awesome. Um, and the thing about it is that, in, you know, I didn't get my necessarily get whatever need to read that was. Like it's a projection of like, I need time to myself because I'm constantly bombarded. Like, what is this idea of time to myself? Like, I need the time to myself to realize that when I'm in the presence of others, I don't need to, like, I'm okay. So yeah. that I don't need time to myself. I don't know. It's a funny thing, but, um, but by what I've realized, you know, I'm really seeing, you know, the, like do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And you know, what goes around comes around, what you put out, you get back. Like all that, all those teachings really beginning to understand on a deeper level, like viscerally, that I, my needs were met yesterday in a profound way that I can't even begin really to intellectualize or, you know, cognitively understand. It's more just this knowing like, wow, I experienced something really amazing yesterday. And so what, I didn't get to read another chapter, you know, so what, my reading was interrupted. There, you know, so that again, the one-to-one, -one, like thinking that my needs have to get met and they get met like this, when really maybe my actual need is to experience this timelessness and this deep connection with my daughter where I'm sitting there and I'm like, man, I just like am so blessed that I get to hang out with you right now. Like the, that I get you, like you're my little buddy and I get to hang out with you. And this is so cool. You know, like not everybody has this. So many people are alone and I get this little buddy who's like super awesome and funny and like just so darn cute. You know, it's just, yeah. So, yeah, I love that. I love how you put that. It was so beautiful how you put that about how our children learn patience. Like, yes, that is a realization that I've been coming to as well. Like I don't actually have to teach her patience. It's like not an active of doing right. Like teaching her patience. It's just me being patient or like allowing patience to unfold or whatever. And then I also, what you were just saying about, about like getting that you did get your needs met 
it just makes me think of, I've been thinking a lot lately um, about that maybe I don't actually know what my needs are necessarily or like what I, what I actually need on like a, a, like I know what my immediate needs are, but maybe I don't actually know what my needs are in a bigger picture. And I've been thinking about this a lot because just like looking at my life and, you know, I have this beautiful house, I have this property. It's not any of it. What is not what I would have chosen. I was very adamant. I didn't want to live in this house. Like I didn't want this farm. Like there's no, not enough trees and the house is too big and whatever, all this stuff. And I was thinking the other day about what it, what it is that I think my life should have looked like. And I mean, so much of what I have is what I think my, like, I always wanted to live on a farm and all this stuff, but the piece is like the house, for example, my vision of a house really is like a dilapidated shanty, you know, like when I think about it, like it's, you know, an old rundown house with all the quirks because my grandparents lived on a farm and they had this house, like the roof was held up by a pole that they put in their living room forever. And it was heated by this old furnace. And I just have such great memories of being there that that's what I had associated with like success for me. So I'm looking at all these places in my life where um, I'm starting to realize that actually in actuality, my real life is so much nicer and more comfortable than like living in a house where the roof is falling down all the time or you know like where there's a leak a water leak or so, which is the reality of like my grandparents house and so I started thinking maybe it's this situation where God's vision for my life is so much bigger than my own vision. I can't even fathom. I can't even fathom. I mean, if somebody were to tell me we'll give you like a mansion and billions of dollars and you could have maids and all this stuff, I would vomit. Like, ugh, no way. I don't want any of that stuff, you know? But like, what's wrong with that? Like if, you know, if that's what God's vision for my life is, then, you know, maybe I shouldn't be so disgusted by having nice things or this whole thing. And it, so it's kind of the same thing about like the needs, like not only our needs, but like, what we deserve or what the gifts that like God wants to bestow upon us and how, like, I know for myself, I just reject those gifts all the time. And, um, you know, like, I think I told this story last time that we were camping and these people, I was like, maybe somebody will give us firewood and our neighbor literally offered us firewood. And I was like, Oh no, thank you. You know, because I didn't want to like be a burden or whatever. And Sam was like, you don't turn down free firewood. Are you crazy? <laughs> you know? So, um, but yeah, there's this, there's so many places in my life where I'm like, oh no, 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 I don't need to have that. Like, that's just too much. Or like this house, it's like a nice big house. And like, I don't need a house this big. Like I could live in a hovel underneath a bridge and perfectly be perfectly happy, you know? And I know because I have, but, <laughs> um, but like, maybe it's okay that we get that. It, like, how can we start to see what we have in our life as our needs being met, like unknown needs that we have that are being met. So like your day with your daughter, so many things like your connection and like jo feeling joy and just like getting to hang out with this person that you love and like be completely undisturbed and just be in the flow. Like that's a need. It's just maybe not a need that we think of, you know, like right off the bat, because there's so many other material, I guess that's it. We're getting caught up in the material need instead mm -hmm. of this. What's the spiritual need right now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, what I have come to with that day yesterday was like, so Joe Dispenza has this meditation called tuning into new potentials. And, um, you know, you basically pick whatever thing that you want to see happen in your life. And then you do this meditation around it. And, and so I wrote out a list of all these things that I would like to see different, that I would like to change. And, and I was looking at it thinking, okay, this is a long list and I don't know where to start. And I don't know if I'm in a place where I'd actually be able to believe it like really tune in enough to the energy of that experience that I could actually bring it to fruition in my life at this point. You know, like for instance, physical stuff is like super hard for me, you know, wanting to have perfect vision again, or like, like I'm, I intend at some point to heal the, you know, the holes in my teeth, for instance. Um, 
And it's like, I just, I don't think at this point, no matter how many times I did this meditation, that I would actually be able to believe it possible for my teeth to grow new bone, you know? So what I realized after kind of working with stuff for a little bit was that at the core of everything, and what he talks about with the people who, you know, experience big changes or just come away transformed in some way, even if they didn't have like a spontaneous healing was that the experience of love. And what he talks about with himself is, you know, he'll go into a meditation and he'll have this mystical experience and he'll go, I didn't know I could, there was more love that I could feel more love. And then he'll feel more love the next time. And, you know, like that there is just literally this unbounded energy of love that exists for us. And, um, it's completely unlimited and never ends, you know, and, and realizing that at the core of everything that I feel dissatisfied about in my life or would like to see change at the core is that I am not experiencing the amount, the level, the quality of love that I would like to be experiencing in my life. And so after I realized that I shifted my meditations and I shifted the way I was doing them, I shifted my focus. And I started just doing meditations with the intention of experiencing more love. And I have to say that when I did that, I, the quality of my days changed. And I realized that the last, you know, I, I called my mom two days ago, maybe, and I talked to my landlady last weekend. And there were just these two conversations where I realized just in sort of you know, catching up and talking about myself and just the energy that I was experiencing in that conversation, like how good I felt, how, and I, it wasn't like, I just, I just felt happy. I felt lighter. I felt freer. I just felt so much more love is what I think, you know, that, and realizing like, I have had big experiences of heart opening and love and feeling like you know, that God bliss that people talk about, um, from brief moments. Um, but I think I'm beginning to understand that what I experience as love is vastly different than love. And that this feeling that I am experiencing in myself is actually some expression, like a, <laughs> the tip of the iceberg kind of, but some expression of a greater feeling of love. Um, because I think that's, you know, that's what is the source of all of this. That's from, you know, the place from which all of this flows. And, um, so realizing like that, that, that's the foundational need, right? That's what my heart has been aching for, for all of these years, you know, that, and I, I can see myself as, you know, I have memories of this little child, this, you know, like two year old and just remembering just remembering that 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 person in me that energy that would continue to seek out love in the face of getting shut down and getting rejected but then because that was the strongest impulse right this this need to connect and be loved and love i kept going back and kept going back and kept going back and eventually you know the amount of rejection and the amount of shut down and all of that and the lack of it being received or reciprocated or whatever it was, you know, eventually that had the effect of shutting me down and hardening me off. But really that impulse is, is, is what it is. Like it's the source. It's like, it's the thing that bubbles up inside of you that needs to be expressed. And as a child, because you have no inhibitions and you don't have the thoughts like, oh, I'm not going to go to that person because that person keeps rejecting me. You're like, no, but I just love and I just want to be with you, you know? And like, I see it with my daughter. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if there was something else after that, but oh, it was about the needs. So yeah, realizing like that, that is, that's the need. That's the foundational need behind everything. Behind, and, and I've read that in different ways too, that, you know, that everything, everything speaks of love. And, you know, it's just people's warped way of expressing it or traumatized way of expressing it, that it comes out the way it does. But really that's the foundational need. Because if I feel 
like nothing can harm me because I am loved. Like if I feel that I am divinely and supremely loved, like what do I care about anything else? Right. Yeah. I, my, uh, one thing I love that my daughter does is whenever she is trying to like be with me, but I have to do something else or trying to be with somebody else. Like if she's wanting to be with her dad or something like that, you know, she'll get really emotional and she'll say, but I just want to be with you because I just love you. And I just want to be with you. And it, you know, it's like so heartbreaking, but it makes me realize like, yeah, it's that she just wants to be with me because she loves me. And all she needs is to just like be with me. And that's totally fine. So I need to create that space for her. And then you know, on the love thing. Yeah. Like I've, I've thought this for, had this thought for a long time, although I've never, I don't, I'm starting to get a, a bigger understanding, but I also don't have an understanding myself so much, but I've thought for a long time that people just don't have any concept of what love is. And yeah, we're all yearning for this thing that's unnameable. And it's this thing that you can't, we just have no idea of the vastness of it. And, you know, it, I was having this conversation when I was in back home with some friends and one of their daughters, um, she's 13 and somebody was asking her these questions and, um, you know, asking her about like relationships and all this stuff, like what she thought and like if she thought she'd be married and all this stuff or whatever. And, um, as they were asking these questions, I, I just was like, I, I, I thought, that, I thought that the questions were totally inappropriate. And so I just was like, I just said, um, do you even know what love is? Like, what does that mean to you? Like, what does a romantic relationship mean to you? Like, what does a sexual relationship mean to you? Like, what do these things even mean to you? Cause you're 13. Like I couldn't have no words for that when I was 13. And by her explanation, I could understand clearly, not only did she have no idea, but nobody else in the room that was asking the questions had any idea what any of those things meant because they were very superficial and their responses were very superficial. And, um, you know, since I've been doing this, these meditations with self-realization fellowship, the, a lot of it is about it's, it's active meditation. Like you're never just sitting in silence. You're always making an appeal to God, talking to God. Like, and so one of the things I'm working on is yeah, to feel God's love and to feel the expansiveness of that. And, and all these teachings that I'm reading and everything I'm learning about is just saying, God is love. Like God is love. And he's, and he's all, he manifests himself or God, he, she, whatever you want to call God. I'm using he right now, but, um, he manifests himself in, there's like 10 different manifestations, love, bliss, wisdom, all these other ways, but that uh, really God is love. And so when I hear that, I think, well, obviously we have no idea what God is. And obviously you have no idea what love is because if God created all of this, all of this is God's dream. This is all God's thought. Then, and it's all has to be love. Then, you know, it, it and I've, I've, I've long had the feeling that like this concept of tough love that people don't believe exists. Like, I believe that does exist. Like sometimes love is hard on you. Like sometimes love pushes you to a place that's uncomfortable or whatever, and, but it's even so much more than that. It's like so much more than soft and sappy, so much more than challenging, so much more than transformative. It's unfathomable. I can't even, I don't even know how big it is, but it's got to be as big as all of creation, <laughs> which is pretty huge, you know? And I was doing a meditation a couple of days ago and for the first time, just for an instant, like, I mean, just a couple of seconds, I was able to feel the a lack of separation. So I, the oneness, the actually actual oneness, I was able to feel it with my set between myself and the whole of existence. And, it, and it was just a flash, but uh, man, it left me yearning for more. And I was like, wait, 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 what was that? And it, you know, and I knew that that's how it was going to happen. I knew whenever I experienced it, that I was going to be like, Oh wait, you know, I feel it. But, and so, you know, it kind of happened that way, but and I can't even explain it or put into words how it really felt, but it was the first time I've ever actually experienced in my being the vastness of everything and of, of which I'm going to sum up in one word as God. And, you know, that's the problem with language. I feel like is that we try to, when you put something into a word, you like take it from way out here to this one little point thing, which is kind of interesting because that's how 
it's said that we came into creation. Like we are this cosmic vibration ohm, right? And then we condense down into these two poles that created one. So positive, negative, and then it created the one. And that's how we came into being. We're just a condensation. And so to think like, what's the opposite of that? And I was thinking, you know, last year we were talking a lot about all of the creepy stuff that was happening in the world and just really like, I remember telling you that one of my biggest fears that came up last year was I was afraid that there was more evil in this world that I could never have even imagined. And it was so much bigger that like, I couldn't even have fathomed, fathomed how evil like people could be or how much evil could exist in the world. But what I learned since then is that Yes, there is so much evil. There's so much darkness. And I've learned this on my own experience of going into my own darkness. It's never ending. Like you will never get to the bottom of your own darkness, but it's also the opposite. There's also that much infinite love and that much God, like that much expansiveness in the opposite way towards light or expansion, whatever you want to call it. And so there, like knowing how deep I've been into darkness and go, going so deep that I realized that there was never going to be an end. And I just had to like cut the cord and say, I'm done with this, knowing how deep I went and that I haven't even been to that expansiveness comparative to that. Right. Like I haven't even been that big or that loving or that joyous, um, you know, and that wasn't even close to the end, you know? So I, I just know that there's just so much out there. There's just so much love and so much abundance and so much joy and just, so much creation out there that we haven't even thought of, you know, like we're still not even having original ideas. Like nobody on this planet has an original idea, you know, like, like we haven't even touched even remotely getting into any territory that's new. We're just repeating history over and over again. And, you know, so I'm excited for <laughs> whenever we all jump off the time cycle and like go into this new uncharted territory that is where we are supposed to be, I guess, as immortal beings. Mm. We're limitless. We, yeah, we to, well, we totally are. That's why I was going to go with it. Because so you had you said earlier that you know there are unanswered prayers, but actually there aren't any unanswered prayers because everything is exactly what we created to be. We may have the thought of a prayer, but if we're not embracing the experience of that prayer being answered, then then. Well, and sometimes no answer is the answer, right? Like no answer is an answer, right? right? Like yeah, but your answer's no. <laughs> always going to get what you put out, and so words have limited, I guess, power of vibration. Um, but yeah, that I mean, that, that's the whole thing with you know leaving um, leaving the loop of going from the past to the future to the past to the future and going and you know round and around on that. Um, merry-go-round or not merry-go-round. <laughs> um, but you, you know, you end up, we'll just cut that part. <laughs> um, you end up, you know, just looping back. And so, you know, you said at one point on the, like a few episodes ago, maybe that, you know, words are spells. And so, but it's the energy that we put out really is casting a spell into the universe. And um, that whole concept of coming into this present moment is that when we arrive in this moment, we are one with the quantum, with that divine consciousness, intelligence, whatever you want to call it. Um, we, we are suddenly aligned with all possibilities and from there you can create anything and you can create something new. Um, which I was thinking about this recently because I think I mentioned it on the podcast at one point, but I like early on, like early teens, maybe I, I came up with this theory or this, I had this idea that we live always in the center of a circle and we are the center. And then, you know, surrounding us is every possible choice that we could make. Um, and I think on the podcast, I mentioned that and then realized that it was actually three-dimensional and it's just, you know, infinite possibilities. Um, and it's true and not true because for most people, I think we're not actually on the center of the circle. We are, 
you know, on a, on a merry-go-round or like we're on the circumference where we're just following the same loop of behavior and thought and emotion around and around and around and around and around. But to actually access the infinite possibility of choices that do exist, we have to go into the center of the circle, arrive or the sphere or whatever, arrive in that moment where new creation is possible, something that you never imagined. And, um, you know, Joe Dispenza talks a lot about the, um, you know, not being able to think greater than you feel. And so then you get stuck in these loops where you're, you have thoughts equal to your emotions. And so in order to change yourself and change your life and create new possibilities, um, you have to be able to think greater than how you feel to trigger new kinds of emotions and then create new possibilities going forward. Um, and so coming from that perspective, like you're talking about, you know, God, God's gift to you or idea of love or whatever could be, you know, you with a mansion and, you know, all that stuff. Um, but like we're, you may never envision that for yourself because you don't want it, but also maybe because it seems so far fetched to have yeah, something. Like, why would that ever happen to me? And I don't need to have right. it. So like, yeah. 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 But really the sky is the limit, which I don't even know what the sky is. So it's limitless. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, in that talk, um, I, don't, I think that I sent this one to you, the, um, the power of your thoughts or something oh, like that. Oh, your thoughts are powerful. Brother, yeah. Your thoughts are powerful. Yeah. By brother Anandamoy. Um, there was something in there that he said that I've been thinking about a lot. And it was that, you know, all these thoughts are God's thoughts. None of them are your mm. thoughts. You're not mm. thinking any original thoughts. They're all God's thoughts. So if you have a problem with your thoughts, be mad at God. Don't be mad at yourself. And you know, like I spent a long time being mad at God. So I was like, Oh no, now I have to go back to being mad at God. But then what he says after that is, you know, it's what you're, it's what you're tuned into. You're picking, if you're having all these negative thoughts of God's, it's because you're tuned in to those negative thoughts. Like you didn't create those thoughts. You're not a bad person because you're having those thoughts. Those are God's thoughts. So you don't need to even worry about that part. All you have to worry about is changing your frequency. Like you change the dial on a radio and you know, there's a million different ways to do that. Music, sound, what, you know, there's so many different ways you can do that. Um, but yeah, just making sure you're tuned into the frequency that you want to be living in. And that's something that is, you know, challenging for me. Like I was saying, when I go back home, being in the space of my family, whose frequency is so dense and like not joyful and, you know, all of these things and it's really challenging. And so I always have to remember because here at my house, I have my routines that keep me, you know, like in a good state of mind. But when I go to somebody else's space, it's hard for me to have those routines, you know? So I had to remember that I needed to make sure I was reading, you know, spiritual stuff that I was spending time in nature, that I was still eating good food and not succumbing to eating, you know, food that somebody else had cooked for me and all of these different things. And, um, yeah, like I would just take my daughter and we would just leave and go to the lake and hang out at the lake for a while and just to recalibrate ourselves. And she kept asking my mom, she was like, are you going to come with us, grandma? And my mom was like, no, I wasn't invited. And I was like, yep, that's right. You weren't invited. Like, we're just going to go. Like, I just needed to go and not be, and it's nothing wrong with my family. It's just that I, they're at a different frequency than I am. And I can't, I just get so depressed whenever I'm there. And so yeah, it's it's hard to stay in your own frequency outside of this, or at least for me, outside of my ecosystem, it's difficult for me to stay in that frequency. And I have a friend who's really good at this. Like she literally walks around everywhere she goes with an incense, an incense stick burning, like into the grocery store, into the YMCA. Like she's been kicked out of several places. And she's like, I can't believe that they won't let me burn my incense. I'm like, well, you are carrying fire around in public, you know, but she's just so in her own like bubble and she just takes it everywhere where she goes. And it's hilarious, but that's like how she has to keep herself 
That's the only way she can keep herself sane, especially in the world that she's living in because she's living in a really challenging environment. But um, yeah, it's, it's all about like the frequency and tuning into, tuning into where you want to be. Like, and, and the thing is, is if you don't know, then you don't know, right? Like mm-hmm. you don't, I was having this conversation with my, with my brother because he's trying to change his life. And I'm like, the thing is, is you don't even know how you want to feel. So you need to figure out what that is. Like look at somebody's life. And this is how, why Tony Robbins is great because he like supercharges you with his feelings of like his life and makes you want to live his life, you know, but he like, he's just like sends you his vibration of all this high energy. Like, whoa, I'm instant. He's like a shot of uh, espresso or something, you know? <laughs> and so you get this shot of like, that's how it feels to feel good. But then you have like no skills for how to do that in the real life. Um, and so, or at least maybe you do when you take his classes, but when you watch his videos, you're like left totally depressed because you're like, wait, that was an instant high. And now I'm down again. But, um, you like have to figure out what it even feels like. Like what, what is it? You know, like look at someone else's life. How are they? I did this as a teenager, like looking at other people's lives that were different and just always holding this picture of my mind of like, I want to feel like that person feels right there. Like that's where I'm going. And I, I imagine that they felt good. I have no idea, but that's all I had as a kid to see that there was something outside of the way that I grew up. And so I just did that for as long as that carried me until I learned more, more tools, you know, but it's a great starting point is like, look at other people's lives and like that person smiles a lot. <laughs> Maybe that I just want to smile more, you know, and just start there. Yeah. Well, it's interesting about, you know, what you're saying about going home because it's almost like, like if everybody's like at an incoherent frequency or a lower frequency and you come in with this high frequency, it's like a, like a numbers game kind of, you know, where it's like your high frequency is like looking for resonance everywhere. And you're like, is it here? Is it here? Is it here? Nope. Is it here? Oh, it's nowhere. <laughs> and so then it like comes in closer and closer and closer to you until it just goes all the way inside of you and you can't find it anymore. You yeah. know, like it's still there. It doesn't go away, but it's just the, the pressure of that incoherence or that low vibration or just other vibration is, is so strong. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's the, the blood thing makes it harder because you're sharing mm. the same blood. So it's literally like you're in the same waters. So when I'm here, it doesn't affect me as much, but when I go there and I'm surrounded by their water, it's like literally being dumped in their swimming pool of like all their vibrations around me all the time. And like here I'm in my own swimming pool doing my own thing, you know, and there I'm in their swimming pool and even though they try to accommodate me by buying the food that I want and like whatever, all this stuff, it's, it's hard for them too. Like when my mother comes here, we don't have a TV, you know, we don't have like Wi-Fi or anything like that. It's really hard for her to be here. And she keeps saying, I kind of want to come and stay for a month this summer. And I'm like, laugh at her. Cause I'm like, no, you don't. It's like, she's maxed out at two weeks too. Just like I'm maxed out at two weeks being there. So you know, the compromises we make to have these relationships, Yeah, <laughs> but maybe put up the tent in your yards. <laughs> of course she maybe only lasts like a week there, but yeah, um, she, she wants well, to buy a camper and put it out so she can have a camper with a satellite oh. dish on it. <laughs> Just like, then I have a camper in my yard. Like I don't want a camper <laughs> in my yard forever. Uh. Well, I'm also, I think it's also, um, a matter of, you know, the longest, you know, the, those relationships are not only the longest, but they're the closest and they're the most tied into whatever version of you that they know. And so even if they are completely detached from whoever you choose to be now, and they're not trying actively to hold you to an older version of yourself, it's like, I find this with myself, like I'm, I'm toying with the idea of going back to Ohio for a trip, by the way. <laughs> And, uh, and I, I'm really, really aware of this, that like, I am, I feel like I'm like rocking it right now. You know, like I have a long way, I have a, you know, a lot more than I'd like to see in my life and in my experience and all that stuff. But like where I am, I feel like I'm in a stride and it feels so good. And this tends to be the point that I reach, or I don't know that I've reached this point before, but you know, when I get kind of this feeling, I'm like, okay, now I can handle the challenges. And it's like a little bit too soon. And I just get yeah. flat on my ass over yeah. and over. Mm-hmm. And I, I really, it's like 
the stakes are too high now. I'm too far. I'm, it's yeah. too big. It's too, you know, and so I'm really aware of that. And so I've been, I've been thinking about this idea a lot, like what happens and, and how can I be in that space and why is it that it's so hard and what do I need to do and all that stuff. And, and realizing that, you know, a lot of it has to do not with how I necessarily feel about those people or maybe not even the attachments or associations I have with the place, but more about what I think, what I project is then expected of me. Um, because I really don't have any idea what people in my family think about me, <laughs> you know? And so I'm like, if I knew that they thought I was a piece of shit and I'd be like, okay, well, I'm not a piece of shit. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to know that. And then I'll just not be the piece of shit. And then we'll all see that I'm not, you know, or something, but like, I don't, I don't know really. Um, and so, which in and of itself is a trigger of old paradigm, old programming, this like me always trying to figure out, um, what everybody thinks and what I'm supposed to be doing and make sure that I get it right and not screw up and you know, all that stuff. So realizing like it actually is just me. It's all me and what I do to myself in that context, because even though it's potentially a lower vibration than where I am currently in this moment, um, I personally make the subconscious choice to just step out of this, move yeah. over here and put on the old clothes, you know, and like yeah. step into the lower vibration version of me that I used to be that I've been fighting to get out of. And it's like, well, that's silly. Why don't I just bring me where I am here? Like just transplant myself here, there and just continue. Um, and so because like you're getting the triggers, you're getting the cues rather like the environmental cues that like, this is who I'm supposed to be in this place. And um, I guess what, like where I have been really working lately is, is recognizing that I don't have to, I don't have to individually address all of that. I don't have to individually address like, oh, this is what happens when I go there and this is how I feel and this is who I become and this is why, because this happened and this is, these were my relationships and blah, 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 you know, forever and ever. Like, because like you're saying, that's the darkness that never ends. Like I'd actually don't have to do that. All I have to do is just become aware that that's what's happening yeah. and then say, well, I'm just not going to identify with any of that anymore. And that's what I'm doing in my life now where I'm anything as much as I'm able, anything that is in any way, like a rub against me where it feels like anything, but this like peaceful love, it's like, oh, that's just, I'm identifying and attaching to whatever that stimulus trigger cue, environmental cue is, and I'm identifying with it in some way. So I don't even have to deal with what it is. I don't have to go through the whole thing of understanding why I'm angry now and figuring out how not to be angry and like convince myself that I'm a better person and I've arrived at a better place, whatever. It's like, I just have to cut the cord and not identify with it anymore. And it's funny because I keep, I'm in this place where like all of the teachings that I've ever read, um, I'm now... <laughs> it's just like, you know, you, when you're, when you're starting down a spiritual path and you, you come up against yogic traditions and Buddhism and you come up against, even, you know, even teachings in Christianity, if you can get it without like the religious overtones and the, you know, all that stuff and just get like the straight teachings and, and all of this wisdom, you read it. And because you haven't experienced it, you can't really live it, but you try to get to it by doing the practices just formulaically, you know, it's like, yeah. like nonviolent communication and VC. Yeah. Like you can say, I am feeling upset right now because my need for, um, respect is not being met or whatever, something like that. You know, it's like, you can say it, but if you aren't actually, or, you know, like if you're trying to understand something, it's like, well, are you, are you feeling sad right now because this thing happened, but you're doing it from just like the formulaic, well, this is yeah. how the sentence goes. Like it doesn't actually get you to the outcome, but it's maybe no. part of this, the process of learning yeah. it. But then it's like, 
I'm actually getting things. And so suddenly then I'm thinking back on all these teachings and going, oh, I get that now. That makes total sense. But you couldn't teach it to me by teaching it to me, right. <laughs> you know, from right. the teachings. Yeah. It is all experiential. Yeah. The, yeah. the, it's really hard for me to be, you know, I don't have like, um, the thing when I go home, I don't have the thing of like, I'm supposed to be a certain person. It's more in that situation. It's more just like, um, just the energy of that place. Like it just like sucks me in and makes me this, I don't know. And, and I was tell, talking to one of my friends because every time I go back, I say this, I'm like, I think I'm not coming back here ever again. And she's like, you realize you say this every time and you realize it's the place that you're staying at. It's not anything else about what goes on here. It's just where you stay. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. You do always tell me that. And so then I started thinking, well, maybe I should get a camper and like go camp out at the lake when I'm there or something like that. But it's just really, it's hard I don't know. And maybe it is about me being, it's just different. It's not like there's these expectations on me to be a certain person. It's just that I can't be, I can't be like healthy. It's just that, like, I can't be physically, mentally, spiritually healthy in that environment. So just it, the situations rapidly devolve and I just get like people say this now, like they know what's happening. Like they watch me just go from like being happy myself or whatever to slowly becoming more and more quiet to slowly like just kind of devolving, like going into myself. And then I start getting cranky and it's just, you know, this whole thing that happens every single time. And it really does have a lot to do with not being in my own physical space, which is a challenge that I've had for a long time. And I don't really know how, you know, Donna Maria would tell me all the time, like you need to create a bubble and then you take that bubble with you everywhere you go. And you just live in that bubble. And I mean, that bubble is your mind. Like we live inside of our minds, but I don't know if it's like my Zodiac signs or what it is, but I'm so permeable. I was actually just reading this in a book this morning and this could be it, but it's a, a traditional Chinese medicine book. And it was talking about if you have a weak kidney, uh, I don't know if it was Yang, I think it was weak kidney Yang, that you are susceptible to what they called uh, evil chi or like external attacks. And I was thinking maybe I just need to like work on my kidneys. Like maybe it's just like, I don't have a force field. Like I don't have, I'm too permeable. I just need to have a force field or something. But um, anyway, I don't know. I, I just, going home is just, I don't want to do it ever again. <laughs> it's really hard, but nobody would ever come here if I didn't go there. So it's like, well, I guess I don't, I can't ever see those people again, except for my well, mom. She comes here, but that's what the, uh, um, well, I don't know who said it. I'm feeling like it was a a wise sage, but you know, you think you're enlightened, go home. Go home. Eckhart Tolle. Yeah. yeah I was going to say that. Yeah. Eckhart Tolle. Him? Yeah. It's in one of his books. He says, if you think you're enlightened, just go home. It's like, yeah, exactly. Every time I go there, I'm like, nope, back to square zero. <laughs> 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 totally not having any idea of what's going on in my life. <sighs> yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a challenge. I don't know the, I don't know that I'll ever get to the to enlightenment in this lifetime, but I'm willing to live 120 years maximum to do it. <laughs> if the, okay. if it's more than that, I got to get out of here and take a break for a while and then I can come back, but I really don't want to come back. <laughs> well, I think there's something, I mean, there's something to be said for your space because I mean, what you're doing is you are creating, you know, in your, your house, your land, your environment, you are consciously creating the environment to reinforce the frequency that you want to be living at, the kind of life that you want to have. And um, it, it makes a lot of sense that then, I mean, beca well, because we are all one, right? We are all just expressions of the same energy. And so we are, you don't have to be like victimized or at the effect of in that really negative way, but just that we we share energy with each other all the time. We share energy with space. We share energy with all of life all of the time. And so naturally, whatever energy we are sharing space with is going to play out in our experience. And so, you know, there's a lot to be said for carving out a physical space that is in alignment with where you're going and who you want to be. And I mean, I, I, 
I think about that a lot just in terms of my life now and where I live. And I'm con constantly assessing this because I'm in a place where there are people who have lots of love in their hearts. They care about each other. They care about supporting each other. They do so all the time. Um, but the, you know, social climate of this place right now is not well intellectually i would say it's not in alignment with where i am and who i feel i am and what do i want what i want to align with and create for myself and my family you know um but it is in so many other ways and does you know how much does that matter and how much do i um how much can I carve out my space, like in my house, in my yard, <laughs> you know, how much can I carve out that energetic space here? Um, and not, and have it not matter and just reap the benefits of this particular living space, um, that, that are advantageous, beneficial. It's funny though, as I'm saying this inevitably, invariably throughout my life, whenever I'm in a situation like this, the answer is always go. Yeah. Well, it's that's like, the thing. Yeah. 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 Like you have if it's to, not like, a hell yes, it's a no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and what I was just thinking, it's kind of the same thing. It's like, okay, so what I said about my mom, like my mom has a hard time coming here. And so I have to look at that and be like, well, okay, other people, when they come into my space, feel that my space is nourishing, that it's healthy. Mm -hmm. They feel good when they're here. Um, they like being here. So, and I'm, I feel that I've created a healthy space, like a, a comforting, nourishing space where people can be relaxed and feel nourished. And so then I have to look at like, okay, well, why doesn't my mom want to come here? And like, what do I feel when I go to her space? I don't mm -hmm. feel happy. I don't feel nourished. Like I feel comfortable because it's the known, but, mm -hmm. um, there's lots of things about it that make me extremely uncomfortable and like spiritually. So it's like, she doesn't want to come into my space because it's healthy. And I don't want to go into her space because it's unhealthy. And so it's like where you're at, like, mm. that's the same thing. You're kind of have an, from a different perspective, but like, you've got this, you're creating, cultivating this health in your life, right? Like this beauty, this, you know, intelligence and like just having this certain specific frequency that you're carrying. And those other people maybe partially want that, but also aren't completely in alignment, maybe intellectually mm. with their spirit, you know? And so we have to be able to delineate like what's mine and what's yours. And like, is this actually me? That's the problem. Cause I don't want to go home or is it my mom? That's the problem. Or like, I mean, does that even matter? But like, just knowing that, that some people just can't handle being in a healthy environment. Some people can't just in handle being in a free thinking environment. Some people can't handle being in a, you know, a social environment, like whatever, like everybody's got their own bag. They've all, everybody's got their own ecosystem that they like to float around in. Um, you know, and we just float around on ours and we bump into other people who have a similar ecosystem and like we can kind of groove with them or whatever, but yeah, just having your own ecosystem is really important. Well, and taking it back to, um, you know, what we were talking about with what kind of life we could live and the possibilities and we can't even think beyond what we know. Um, but, you know, it's like each time you go like up level your life, it becomes the new norm and it becomes the new known. And you're like, okay, well, this was way better than where I was before and I don't want to go back. So if I stay here, I know I won't. But what happens if I let go of this again? Well, I keep up leveling, you know, and, and if you don't surrender to that possibility, then you don't create any space for God to deliver for you, right? Yeah. In a way, oh, it's oh, like anywhere. a, right. It's like a passive way of saying no to what the universe could give you. Right. Um, and, and there will always be reasons to stay, but there are infinitely more reasons to go, which is the infinite quantum field of possibility. Like anything, anything that you can imagine exists in the quantum field and then things you can't even imagine. And, um, I, so with the, with the whole, um, going to the car dealer yesterday experience, I had, I did this tuning into new potentials meditation beforehand. Cause I was, I was like anxious about it for some reasons. And, um, but I, I was aware even before doing the meditation that there was something in me that, that had such, 
hesitation around it. Like, I don't know that I could actually really surrender to the possibility of this really going like amazingly well in this particular way that I want, because I was too bound in by the known of, of certain aspects of what this going there was going to be like. And, um, and so sure enough, some of those things that I expected kind of played out. Like at first when I showed up, I was like, I think everything is going to be just the way I wanted it, you know, but then I, it was like, it wasn't fully a closed deal or whatever. And then eventually, you know, it ended up going the way it did, but it was okay. And it turned out to be, you know, and probably an even better experience, this beautiful experience that I had. Um, but just realizing that I wasn't, um, like, I think I have a, I think I have a parallel anxiety around like walking away from the house that I live in currently, for instance, because it's like, I know in theory that I could make this like that. I could like really put all that energy out and create this future living situation or whatever. Um, that's even better than this. And it's even more in alignment with who, what I want to be, how I want to be living in my life. Um, but I just, I don't have that absolute faith in that possibility right now. And so I feel that anxiety about stepping out into the unknown and doing it. Um, so yesterday was actually kind of a cool, uh, like, uh, practice run because it was, it was an instance in a very benign way, kind of like this, where it didn't actually go the way that I had envisioned it, which was my fear. But in that experience, it actually, I was given this beautiful gift that was totally different and way better than what I could have imagined. So like, even if it, even if you can't fully lock into that future possibility, the intention of going towards it and then opening up to it, just allow whatever is given, it has to be like better than what you currently are experiencing because the unknown is full of possibilities of a greater future than even yeah. you could imagine. Yeah. And it's a whole leaping before you look thing. Like every hard decision I've had to make in my life, you know, from leaving relationships to moving to everything, it's like, I just had to get to the point where it was like a breaking point where I could say, okay, I can stay here but it would really, I would be losing something if I stayed here mm -hmm. and I could make this leap and I don't know where I'm going to land, but I'm going to trust that like the net's going to appear and it's all going to unfold the way it should unfold. And, um, the hardest time I did that was I did it in a relationship. I was with this man. I had never been with a kind man before. I never even met a kind man before. And he was very kind and, um, we were together for five years. We lived together. And I just knew for two years that I wanted to do something else. Like he was stagnant. He just, you know, he had a good job and all this stuff, but he just lived the nine to five and, you know, he just wasn't happy. And I kept suggesting changes and they were just never going to happen, you know? And um, like, he wouldn't even look at me when we had a conversation and all this stuff. And so it was just not like the situation I wanted to be. And I just knew something else out there existed, but I'd never met a nice man before. I didn't know if like, and at that point in my life, I thought that my life was only going to happen in a relationship. Like I didn't, you know, I didn't even have any idea that like, I could just like go live my life and like live my own life and like not worry about a partner, you know, like I was in my twenties and that was still very much tied up in, in having this like life partner. And I just knew that I couldn't be there. And it took me two years. And I finally was like, all right, I just made this plea. I was like, I, I will leave this relationship. But before I leave this relationship, I have to see that there's somebody else, somebody else out there for me. Like I just had to. And sure enough, like within a few months, this other man came in, kind of swept me off my feet. I told my partner, like literally, like, the man touched my hand and I was like, it's over. And I told, went home and told my partner, I was like, I'm leaving. I'm moving in with my friend. Like I'm out of this relationship. I can't really talk about it right now. I'm going to be honest with you that there's somebody else, but nothing's happened between us. I left and like, it took me, we spent like a year after that, like unraveling our relationship. Like I would go over there every couple of weeks and we'd have a talk and you know, whatever. Um, but he, at that moment he said to me, I thought that I'd met the person I was going to spend the rest of my life with. And I thought, 
You couldn't even look me in the eyes when we had a conversation. Like we couldn't even talk because he would just be like staring at the TV, you know? So I just, at that point I knew we were just two totally different people. We were on the two totally different planets this whole time. And it was me that was making this situation work by just being here. So it was the best decision I ever made. He's still a very kind person. I was friends with him for a long time after that. We don't talk anymore, but he's still, I, he, we have mutual friends. He's still has the same exact life. I mean, down to the same furniture, the same pictures on the wall, the same schedule he does every single day, like everything, nothing has changed. And like one of my friends went over there and she said, I don't even think that he's moved the dog hair off of the sofa, like from the last time you were there. Like, you know, it's just like, he's just living that. I would have still been there if I would have stayed there, you know? And so it's good for me to see that because and obviously I made the right decision. My life is great now, but it's, it's what I wanted. But um, yeah, sometimes you just don't know and you just got to do it. Yeah. Well, that sounds like a good ending note yeah. to me. <laughs> I know that you have to go soon too. Um, mm -hmm. So I say we wrap things up and okay. Thank you to everyone for listening to this conversation between women and join us next time.